My name is Irene Lustig. Um, I'm uh, the filmmaker and director of Years in Sisterhood, which is showing here in Berlin. Oh, this, oh, you love this one. So this is about the letter. This is her, so this is July 1, I guess it's, I found your letter magnificent. That's, this, is the, this is her response to that letter. I found your letter magnificent, except for the part about the cover photo, which is the author of the backpacking piece. <laughs> And I've passed it on to other letters editors who will be in touch with you if we decide to publish it. I'm always very interested in having a look at your journals. You make the life you're living sound irresistible. I hope to hear from you soon and good luck with your building. In any case, have a wonderful summer. So this was the first response to that letter. She's still in New York. I'm still sitting on a log cabin step. Hi, I'm Hannah Congdon and I'm here with Irene Lustig, who's the director of the documentary Yours and Sisterhood. Hi, welcome. Hello. Thank you for talking to us today. Thank you. Um, so with the film, you had 306 participants mm -hmm. in um, the film, I believe. How did you go about finding those individuals and how did you choose which individual was reading which letter and, and that whole process? Yeah, so that's actually, it sounds like an easy question and it's a super complicated question. Um, and I actually developed a term even as I've talked about the project that I started to call it critical casting um, for the way I paired up. And it was actually very, very careful and deliberate. Um, every letter and every person who read the letter was actually a really complicated process of matching someone up with a letter. Um, so I guess there's a few different um, ways that I found people, um, a lot of people came to the project just through social media. So as I was planning, the film was made through 10 different trips and each trip was kind of focused on one region of the US. Mm -hmm. um, so for every region I would put out a social media call when I was planning a trip and I had a survey that people would fill in to sign up to read for the project. And people were, the survey was surprisingly intimate. Like people would actually share a lot of personal information about themselves and sometimes really moving stories that they would write about themselves. Um, so then often through that, I was able to find interesting connections or matches or synergies and yeah. ways of matching up people in letters. Um, did you so, usually, yeah. when you did it with the geographical trips, did you usually match up those geographical locations with where the letters came from Everyone, as well? Yeah, so Everything. every letter is read in the place where it was written. Okay. So it was actually quite complicated <laughs> to find people. So that was one thing, but then one thing that happened that I noticed quite early is just demographically the people who volunteered to sign up, and it makes sense. Uh, people who would sign up through social media and on the survey were overwhelmingly like white middle class educated yeah. readers um, and older also. And mm. that makes sense, like my students don't know what Ms. Magazine was, so it was often like people old enough to know Ms. or remember Ms. Um, and then, yeah, like very, very white, so for every region. And you know, I ended up really for every city just actually doing demographic research to figure out like what is the actual population of the yeah. city and then how can I get closer to that breakdown? Because I think you know, making a project about feminism right now it would be like 100% unacceptable to, to let that stand right? yeah. in terms of who the readers are. So I would do a lot of outreach, additional outreach, um, a lot of local research and like connecting with organizations in different cities. Um, yeah, asking people, friends of friends of friends who live in places. But sometimes also like for very small towns, it was really hard to find people. So if it's a town with like a population of 200, 300, the US is full of these like tiny towns that have like a gas station and a shop and a traffic light and that's it. Um, so for those towns, I would then try to find like, is there a museum in the town or is there a library in the town or who can I contact in the town who can help me find someone? So it's very complicated. And some letters I spent months looking for one reader. So the end of the, the last letter in the film is a formerly incarcerated woman who reads a letter that was written um, from prison in the 70s. And I really wanted to include that letter. It was, yeah. one of, it was the only letter I found that was, I found a lot of prison letters, but it was the only prison letter written by a woman that was kind of about being a woman in prison. And it felt yeah. important to put that in the project. Yeah, and I spent like, felt important to watch. Yeah, <laughs> so that one took like three months just to find the reader for that one. Um, so yeah, it depends. Some of them came easily, some of them were a lot of work, um, yeah. but it was really a matchmaking process. And I thought of it as like finding a pen pal for someone from 40 years ago and kind of making these pairings across time. Yeah. Yeah. And something that struck me was how relevant some of the things being brought up 40 years ago are to the conversations we're having today. So there were discussions of lesbian prostitution and female masturbation, transgender pronouns, mm -hmm. gun crime, which obviously given recent events is particularly relevant. 
And do you think that suggests that we that those women were kind of ahead of their time in the things that they were discussing or do you think it actually is a bit more negative and we think we're making progress and actually when oh know, i think we're not, not really. making progress yeah. at all yeah and i think that's important i mean i've made it uh, throughout my career i make work about history i think about history a lot and i think it's yeah it's a huge misunderstanding ever to think of history as progressive or forward marching you know history is circular it's cyclical it goes backwards it goes forward um, like I think now we're in a little moment, and I'm very curious, this moment around kind of new public conversation and new energy around feminism has totally happened during the time since I've, like it happened during the making of the project and even yeah. since the project and it feels was like a particularly relevant time for this yeah. work I mean, to come When I started well. the project, no one was thinking about 70s feminism. There was no public conversation about feminism at all. It felt like a super marginal thing to be thinking about. So it's been very weird. I mean, it's, it's exciting, but also strange to be finishing this project at a moment where there is all this energy around thinking about this stuff but you know it's like a window or a pocket or a moment in history but it's not like we've been working up to this moment since the 70s mm -hmm. right there was a different moment in the 70s where there was a huge amount of energy and like a giant massive public conversation around feminism and it, it kind of disappeared and maybe it's coming back now and, and mm -hmm. who knows how long it will last um but no, I think all of this is unfinished business. It's not, it's not that those people were ahead of their times. But also, you know, when I read, um, even reading, like I made a few passes through the letters, like I read all the letters in an archive, and then I would come back to the letters as I was planning trips and like reread letters from a certain region and figure out which letters I wanted to shoot. And even in the kind of two to three year span that that, that took, um, I think to me as a contemporary reader, reading from different moments, like different letters would suddenly resonate or feel different to me mm. as a contemporary reader. And I think that's also true about history, like it shifts and changes all the time depending on where you're standing in the present. So like a letter, um, there's a letter I filmed in North Carolina that I filmed right after the, the 2016 election. I traveled through the South um, in the U.S. and um, there's this letter from Greensboro, North Carolina, from a woman who was an in an interracial relationship who talked about the KKK having an exhibit in Greensboro. And I think, like, honestly, the first time I read that letter, it just kind of like, seemed like a throwaway or not that interesting. And then I reread that letter, like, literally right as the election was happening and right as all of this kind of new right wing neo Nazi very public stuff was coming back in the US and like suddenly it felt like this super important yeah. and quite harrowing so actually found letter. new relevance as the book yeah letter. so that letter for example felt really like it signified really it just yeah it resonated really differently to me even just like reading it again a year later in a different mm. moment so i think history always works that way yeah i think and a lot of the letters expose the tensions between the typically white middle class writers of MERS and black or Latino readers who weren't feeling like their communities were being represented accurately or at all. Um, do you think we're still, ha you know, have we made any progress on that front? And how far does the film go to, to maybe trying to overcome some of those um, divisions within the feminist movement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's also such a tricky question, and I think there's a lot of different answers. I mean, I think to really talk about race and to answer that question, I think there's kind of both a complicated conversation to have about the 70s and about now. Like, I think there's a way where the 70s is also kind of simplified or misremembered in terms of what people's historical narrative of 70s feminism was. Um, so on one level, I think there was more kind of coalition building across race and class lines in the 70s than, than we think about yeah. now. Um, so yeah, I just feel like it's important to, to say that and, and remember that because it, it has been really, really, really calcified as a kind of white middle class women's movement and it both was and was not in the 70s. Um, but yeah, no, you know, no. Like again, I think race again, like feminism, it's, it's come back in this very, in the US in this like incredibly harrowing and haunting way is completely unfinished business. Like we haven't fixed it. America is still unbelievably racist. Um, and I've seen even very quickly, like around the 2016 election, there was all this kind of message boards and Hillary Clinton Facebook groups and like millions of women suddenly like making these spaces where they're speaking to each other. Um, and like very, very 
quickly there were like the same conflicts and the same kinds of disagreements and, and fallings out and misrecognition and, and misunderstandings um, around race lines. So yeah, I don't. I think it's it's not. Um, yeah, it's also unfinished business. I don't think we, even within feminism, I think we haven't figured out how to do feminism well. Except for you know, I think young like my students, I think are doing much better in terms of their vision and how they think about feminism um, and really thinking about feminism as, as not just a women's movement but a, a movement that thinks about inequality and difference of all kinds, whether it's disability or race or gender or... Which is exactly what this yeah. film also tries to do in that yeah. it actually binds together quite a, I mean, a very yeah. broad spectrum. So I think people. like when I was thinking about how do I make a film that's about 70s feminism and how do I not reproduce the problem of 70s feminism, I think it was super important to me to just open all of that up in every possible way that I could think of. So, you know, whether that's inviting a deaf transgender reader to read a letter by a les like, presumably, you know, lesbian, able-bodied woman in, in the 70s and, and kind of what that mismatch might, might do or bring up, um, or whether it's, yeah, just making sure to really bring back and include these letters from women of color that maybe didn't get published in the 70s and to think about how those might connect to a similar conversation right now. Um, yeah, I mean, these are just the things I thought about. And I don't know, it's hard to do that right or well, but I think that was what I was interested yeah. in, in trying to do with the project. And um, your previous project, the Worry Box project, which is that still ongoing? Or it is, I've been neglecting yeah. people's worries for a little while, <laughs> but yes, it is ongoing. But that's also formed around the written word, um, as, mm. is, as is this film. Um, what is it about the written word that interests you and, and makes you want to use it as a platform for other means of communication? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I think I'm interested with the actual act of, of handwriting. It's a, it's a lot of things, but I think one thing, there's a kind of intimacy and a kind of care of labor is maybe a, a good way to frame the idea of writing and the written word. Um, and certainly care labor is a kind of concept or a kind of feminist space that people talk about. Um, I think a lot of, um, you know, a lot of my work, I've, think of most of my work as kind of feminist work, um, but also I've made a lot of work about maternity and um, my previous film before this, my previous feature was a film about kind of histories of histories and ideologies of pregnancy and childbirth. Um, but I think I've thought a lot about kind of care labor as an actionable and political space and what it means to spend time on something and, and what it means to communicate in ways that are time-consuming and labor-intensive and you know I think the letter is kind of like that um, and it's a lot you know I'm, I'm in years in sisterhood there is this thing around how we communicate now and, and what what the difference between writing on an internet message board today might be compared to like sitting down in your kitchen with a typewriter or a piece of paper and really like composing a letter um, which mm -hmm. feels very different and yeah more time consuming more intimate and more cared for yeah um the something that i kind of found quite hard to get my head around was what is happening to the identity when these individuals are reading out letters from the past and sort of inhabiting a different voice or in some instances so for example there's the lesbian woman who reads her younger self letter mm -hmm. it feels like it's kind of pluralizing the self in this very complex way mm -hmm. can you expand on that a little bit more yeah i'm very i'm interested in that idea of like embodying um and something you know when i started the project i think i i miss uh I kind of guessed wrong. Like I thought the most interesting thing would be to invite people to do these totally cold readings. And I imagine that the first time someone encounters the letter, this like amazing thing would happen because it was very fresh or they'd be kind of negotiating something in real time. Um, and in fact, what usually happened is I would shoot like four or five takes with each person. And it was really like the third or fourth time that something interesting would start to happen. And you would see, like, you, I could really feel while I was behind the camera and encountering people doing this, that there's a way where just through repeating someone else's words several times, like, something would change or shift after doing that a few times, where you would kind of feel them start to respond or, like, something would happen through, mm. through just that repetition. Um, I think it's a powerful and interesting way to kind of invite people to engage with history 
I think history often feels quite abstract to people and even archives and old things, which I like and spend a lot of time with, but that can feel also abstract or inaccessible to people. Um, so I think I'm often trying to think of a way to get people to like, engage with their body or with their mind or to really bring something to their engagement with mm. history. And this felt like it, it did that. Um, yeah. And also there's the, some instances, so there's some clear parallels between the person reading out the letter and um, what the, like the content of the letter. But there's actually a few occasions where there's a quite a strong mismatch or actually the person mm -hmm. really disagrees with the letter mm -hmm. that they're reading. What do you think it means to take on someone's voice that actually is aggressive towards your own community or towards which you disagree? Yeah, and that again, that was important to me as also a way of just thinking in a way that's complex about feminism or like actually disagreement and, and conflict felt important to me. And I think that's true of feminism more broadly, right? Like it felt really important to me to make a project that's generous enough to both include people that maybe I disagree with and also to invite people to embody something that they disagree with. And like all of that stuff is super, super important. Um, that, you know, it's not, because you know, I think it's naive to imagine that there's a kind of feminism where we're all just like empathizing with each other yeah. all the time, and it's important to me to represent other kinds of, yeah, like more just conflictual conversation or, or discourse. Um, those are some of my favorite moments in the film, is uh, when people really disidentify or, or disagree with with what they've just read. Those feel important. Yeah, and. So Something that I really loved was the way that um, it's very un unperformative um, mm -hmm. when the letter's read out and there's sort of lots of stumbling and tripping up on words and things that would normally be relegated to outtakes are put in the film. And I thought that had a lot of similarities with the idea of the letters being unpublished previously. What's your kind of particular interest in stuff that's on the fringes of publication and, and why do you choose to put that within your work? Mm. So in terms of, yeah, you know, in terms of publication, um, again, as a researcher, which I was at the beginning of the project, reading letters, there is this idea of, you know, also coming back to the 70s, like there's a huge sense of discovery for me to find letters from transgender readers in the 70s, which like I didn't even know that conversation was happening or, or trying to happen with a feminist publication, with a really mainstream feminist publication, mm. I should say, um, or had letters from people of color. I think I found a lot of types of letters that felt like really vital and also really contemporary to me in terms of the issues that they brought up. Um, and just thinking about those letters, yeah, like kind of not getting a voice or not floating to the top 40 years ago, but there's, that there's maybe an opportunity to recuperate or recover or give that conversation a space or a voice right now. Um, I really like the idea of kind of yeah, just having another go at the 70s and maybe making an alternative history of, of 70s feminist conversation that we didn't hear in mm. the 70s. Yeah. And finally, the women that you, well, not just women, all the individuals that you spoke mm. to that read out um, the letters, what were the responses, kind of, what did we not see um, in the film of certain responses? Were people particularly emotional or did it seem quite distant for some people? Um, I think a lot of it is in the film, um, but I've kept in touch with some of the people in the film and it's, I think it's been interesting. Um, yeah, some people wrote to me much later or got back in touch to talk about what it felt like to read the letter. Um, some people I haven't heard from or seen since, since, since shooting. Um, and then also sometimes there's a lot of interesting negotiation before the reading around, like, would you feel comfortable reading this letter? Under what circumstances? How? And again, depending on the person and kind of their politics and their questions about my politics and how, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of kind of off-camera, sometimes a lot of off-camera negotiation around who wanted to be in the project and what, what they needed to know first to feel OK about being in the project. Mm. Okay, thank yeah. you so much for yeah, talking to us thank today. You. Um, yeah, it's really lovely to hear the decisions behind it and yeah. how it was all put together. Yeah, um, thank so you. Yeah, enjoy the rest of your Bellinella. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.